Lisa Jordan is a writer who chronicles life's stranger moments and everyday pleasures on her blog, Lemon Gloria, where she shares stories of marriage, motherhood, and mental illness with equal parts gravity and humor. While she was raised overseas and prefers to think of herself as an international woman of mystery, in reality, she's a mother, wife, and daughter living in D.C. She is writing a book about growing up with a suicidal father. Hi. Several months ago, my friend Lee asked if I knew why I was obsessed with suicide. I got defensive. I'm not obsessed. You are, she said. Your father died over five years ago. I know what he did. What I'm worried about is why you can't let go of it. She was right. It's a scab I've picked over and over. When I was 11, I learned that I was good in a crisis and that my mother was not. I didn't know the phrase good in a crisis and I didn't know what suicide was, but I knew that something was terribly wrong when my mother turned from washing dishes, yelled, oh my God, and ran out of the kitchen, leaving the water running. Years later, she would tell me that the water suddenly went cold. I rushed after her into their bathroom. We opened the shower door, and we found my father crumpled and pale on the gray tile floor. <sighs> Excuse me. I didn't know what he had done. And even after he told me about his cuts, it was years before I would actually understand. But I knew that this was an emergency. My mother froze, and so I ran to the phone and said, call 911, Mama, call 911. As an adult, I learned that you cut with the vein, not across it. With all of his medical training, he would have known this. It gave me hope that he didn't really want to die then. Days later, Dad told me he was sick, but getting better. He said that we must never tell anyone about this, as it could hurt his career. So we never talked about it, even at home. From the outside, we were fine. We thought we were fine. We didn't know any better. Of my dad's seven suicide attempts, the only one in which I was not involved took place my freshman year at college. I swore my roommate to secrecy, and I told her. She asked how I was doing, and I said, fine, it's my father I worry about. I spent most of that year sitting on our floor, eating chocolate and crying. I gained 30 pounds and failed classes for the first time. And still, I didn't know that I was depressed. Neither did my family. My father didn't manifest depression in this way, and so perhaps he didn't recognize it. Or maybe he was so caught up in his own that he didn't realize it. In any case, we never talked of depression, mental illness, or suicide. We never spoke of our secret, but we carried it. It became something that defined me and yet was not about me. For my father's subsequent attempts, my mother panicked, and I took over. I called 911. I saw the hotel number on caller ID. I called Master Coward and found the motel charge and called the police. Over and over in ERs and ICUs, I held my father's hand and looked into his vacant eyes and begged him to stay. I willed the numbers on the monitors and made bargains with God. I was constantly vigilant, and though he almost died each time, he didn't. He came home slightly more diminished, and we were, once again we were afraid every day. But he didn't die, until the time that he did. As for me, one day in 2006, I began crying and couldn't stop. I was heading towards 37 and single and destined to die alone. This, I believed, was my problem. For weeks, I went to work and cried silently in my cubicle. At night, I went home and sat on the floor in fetal position and wept. I couldn't cry while I was running, so I ran a lot. I got really skinny, and I got a lot of compliments. If you asked me how I was, I'd force a smile and say, fine, how are you? A dear friend convinced me to get help. I started therapy and antidepressants. I stopped holding in our secret. I started talking and writing about it, and it felt good. I was not fine, and my family was not fine, and shockingly, nobody shunned us. 
My father was furious that I had shared what I now know was his shame. He said that it was his problem and his story, not mine. Last summer, I reconnected with a high school friend. And in catching up, I told him about my dad's attempts. I told him that his psychiatrist had said that the odds were that he would die by suicide and that we should expect it. And still, I said, I was shocked when he actually did. He said, after six attempts, how could you be shocked? My eventual answer was, because I always believed that I could save him. The morning of May 15th, 2009, my father quietly left their house. For two days, we called everywhere we could think of. We found him at the morgue. For years, I tried desperately to keep him with us. I couldn't. I think everyone but me knew this all along. Now, six years after his death, I've realized I have to let him go.